We always talked about being in the bottom half of the cost curve. Now, everybody wants to be the lowest cost producer. Oh, yeah. And if you ask 75% yeah. of the industry, they're, in the they're all in the first yeah. quartile. Yeah. Well, I think we've got to stop blaming the markets yeah. for our short-term thinking. The reality is the markets were telling us that we can't see you performing consistently over the long term because we can't see the investment that gives us comfort that that's what you'll do. In the end, we don't do a very good job explaining where the value and where the money goes. That's a problem. Not their fault, it's our fault for not explaining well where the, where the, where the value is and who gets what. G'day Money Miners, we are here live at iMark. We've got a, a couple of interviews to, to share, a great chat that we had with Mark Kudafani. Mm. So I think he's, he should be familiar to a few of the Money Miners. This guy has run Anglo-American, Anglo Gold Ashanti, Sons of Gualia, Chairman of Vale Base Metals Unit, Chairman of De Beers, previously worked at Western Mining as well, was the first General Manager of the Super Pit. There's a deep, deep history. He's from Wollongong. Uh, yep. It's a good chat. I feel like we, um, he, he's, he's obviously an A-list mining exec. And he, when you, we asked him some, um, some pointy questions, and, and my, take, my big takeaway, JD, is he answered them like someone who has media training. He'd always sidestep the actual question and he'd give a, you know, like a, he'd give an answer, throw in a bunch of stats and they were compelling and there's a good, really good response in, in there. Well, but, you're off, but you're often thinking, hang on, that was a great response, but you didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> so well done, Mark. We, um, we really enjoyed talking to you and you think, think your insight's great. You're a bloody um, yeah, star, in the, star in the industry and, and think what you've got to say is pretty important too. Absolutely, I'm, I'm keen to share that one. Um, we've also got uh, a few bits of news that we wanna, we wanna touch on. Money Miners, we haven't forgotten about it. There's Mate, the biggest been... bit of news is the fact that Maddie's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't think that's the most surprising bit of news that we've seen in the There's last couple of days. So many parallels between yeah. IMARC and um, our trip to Diggers, including Maddie not being here on the last day when we're interviewing an A-list mining exec. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps for the best, mate. So th yeah. there's a you know quarterly season wrapping up. We um, yeah. we love to do a bit of a name and shame, and unfortunately we we haven't made the time just yet to do that. But it hasn't been forgotten. Don't worry. I the, took a I took a big screenshot of all of the companies um, you know on Stocknest Monster on that last 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 day the 31st mate so I'm going to go through all of them over the weekend and, and pull out some nuggets I reckon absolutely and at the bigger end of town there's a few things we should touch on and sort of prelude to discussions we'll probably have next week so totally a lot of people have been talking about Minres mm. so getting active on Azure to yeah, start with yeah I, this is I, f f to the best of my knowledge, I haven't been able to confirm that this is um, Minres, but there's a lot of buzz and speculation about at the moment that, um, that some of the trading in Azure share price right now above that 350 mark, I think it's traded you know a fair bit north of that now, uh, has been the result of Minres buying. This is, um, it, yeah, it would be an interesting evolution in the deal given Gina's, uh, I think, sub 19%, but close to it. Yeah, 18 and a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And we've talked about a lot of alignment in um, in the way way they play out strategically in, in some of these names. But um, buying together when she's already got a blocking stake, I'm trying to think through like motivations there. And, and maybe the, the one thing I could think of in my head, mate, is maybe it's actually potential deterrent in the delisting process because um, I think I think in order to be there are certain criteria for um, SQM to have the ability to delist a company and I think one of those is a certain threshold of, of percentage of ownership. Substantial, substantial ownership in the, it. There's no guarantee that they would get to that um, that threshold and Minres buying I think actually f would, would facilitate like if Minres voted against uh, or that there was, a, there was a sufficiently large yeah, threshold that was aligned with, with Gina's interest, then it might reduce the risk of potential delisting in the event that the takeover gets triggered and SQM get um, get control. So it would remain listed. There's still some protections to shareholders under that situation. Other people are speculating that Chris is going to come in with his own takeover offer. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see where, where the shares are actually coming from, given that SQM already have 19.9% .9 of the shares out there. Gina has a big slab of shares. There are other major shareholders, you know, have some who have you know, said which way they would potentially vote on an SQM takeover and so on. You got 
There was a, a big crazy stake. There was various other institutions. Yeah, it's, and there's also just plenty of retail who, um, like the equation gets different now. If it's trades at like 365, mm. then do you accept 365 today or, um, you know, a high probability $3.50 in whatever month's time when a transaction completes, but you remove the potential upside of a kicker. It's, the equation changes all the time and some retail just decides to sell into that. Absolutely. Yeah. And other news on MinRares, they've uh, they've made a down payment. Is that is the I, word? I don't like that word. I no. don't think that's the right word. That's what the AFR is running with. But I, yeah. They've bought it and potentially it gets revised a bit. So the number is uh, a bit over 100 million to get Bold Hill. 100, 124 million. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's this announcement on the SGX um, which is the, yeah, the Singapore exchange where Alita um, was, was you know, a listed company. Um, and you, you read this, the announcement has a, is a McGrath nickel letterhead um, and it highlights the consideration component for the transaction is, uh, you know, a, a 124 million bucks essentially, but it's subject to a couple of changes, one being... Um, an independent expert report who might deem there to be a higher value. There's also some potential changes from um, from a tax liability that is currently being worked through by uh, PwC. And another one is just in relation to any potential modifications to an onerous offtake agreement. There could be extra consideration in that result. But I think the down payment is not the right word. I don't know how much the total consideration is actually going to move from here. Um, given all of those things are sort of uncertain at this stage, but um, and I mean, given, given the way independent expert reports yeah. usually play out, well, and, well, who knows? Until and, until we actually see um, what an independent expert sort of opines in this one, I, this is the headline consideration I'm using as my pace case until told otherwise. Um, Beautiful. Is that the news you wanted to touch on, mate, or should we uh, rip oh, in? We, we we absolutely should rip in. Um, we've got we've got some wicked sponsors to highlight the awesome work that they do in our industry, mate. We do, mate. KCA, a new sponsor on board last week. So, if you need mining equipment, get on the website. They've got a they've got a whole bunch of stuff which Trav and I have just become accustomed with what these things actually are. Recently, Maddie, <laughs> more than familiar. When we but, went down to to buddy, uh, yeah, to, we, we we've been underground now, mate. We we know we, what we the get it. Looks like yeah. So you got we've done our underground time. <laughs> you got boggers, front end loaders, you know, yeah. piece Normous. of kit for I, <laughs> IT. So as Maddie so eloquently put it, if you, you know, the underground environment is rough, and if you completely cook your equipment, you need it quickly. You need to hire stuff. Get in touch with the guys at KCA. It's KCA Services. KCA Services They are, and mate, I'm looking at I'm looking at some of these like machines on their website right now, and I'm utterly convinced that I could probably mine any commodity with them <laughs> <laughs> they just look they look impressive they've got wicked kit they keep it in fantastic condition um and they're like available so we're flashing up some of this wicked kit on screen right now get in touch with the team there at kca services thanks so much for buddy being a wicked partner of our show um and we're we're stoked to be promoting a great company that's it kca site services check out the guys and jp search Another, uh, a longer term sponsor, these ones. So if you are an associate level, analyst level, you know, you've had a few years experience in the industry, you're looking to move into finance, whether that's perhaps an equity research gig, a family office, you know, on the flip side, you're a corporate, you're looking to hire for these roles. Yeah. Get in touch with the guys. It's the end of the year, right? Like this is um, Xavier and Michael. You get your bonus. Yeah. And see what else is happening. Yeah. A lot of bonuses are tied to financial year, but- I think like the end of the year, there is also a lot of a lot of movement because people kick off the new year doing a new thing. And what a, what a time to reflect on your life and realize that your current job sucks and you should <laughs> you should get a better one. And the people that know better jobs are Michael and Xavier at JP Search. That's it. And they are they mate. We we the other was it Friday last week. We were in the office, and a wicked money miner just rocked up. Um, carton in hand, carton, carton of dingo in hand, and a and a vape for Maddie is a gift, and it was, um, and his name's Kev, and Kev's a wicked bloke. He rocks in, and he's um, he's just said thanks so much, guys, for the podcast. Don't want to pump our own tires too much, but it was it was it was, it was really nice. That, that, it's thank very you, Kev. cool. So Kev, um, I know Kev has a bit of a f- financial background. Kev, 
I reckon you should bloody um, talk to Michael and, and Zav and explore more job op opportunities that are in the finance world as well. But they'll, they'll hook you up with some, some great stuff. We ripped the ad and I forgot to look at Michael's talking points that uh, he flicked through last night. Sorry, Michael. But they've got a wicked role right now with a, I want to say their name, but I can't, but it's a really interesting company, massive undeveloped uh, project that is going to make its way into development, a board that is phenomenal. They're looking to build out their corporate development team with an analyst or a senior analyst level, so probably two to six years, depending on big four or investment banking experience, up to 170K, super, really, really exciting, um, incredible board at that company. Check it out. Thanks a bunch, JP Search. Money Miners, we got one more thing to say. We are recording this at 125 in Sydney, so yep. 1025 back home in Perth. We just put uh, tickets up for sale for the event that we announced on the 7th of December, so yeah. f five or so weeks away. Yeah, but the tickets for that event went online 25 minutes ago. And a few have sold already somehow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ali has flicked us a message um, saying that they're 45% sold already for this. This is the event in Subiaco, Golden West Brewery, um, live show at a pub, yep. casual, our style. You'll be able to have drinks, you know, food will be going around. There'll be a bit of a show happening. So um, a good chance to catch up and meet everyone, you know. I can't wait to meet you there if you've got a ticket. I'm a little bit startled at how fast these tickets have been gobbled up already. Uh, but yeah, like I'm not sure if any will be available left by the time you listen to this or watch this, given um, given how fast the initial 45% have gone. But if by some chance tickets haven't sold out yet and you're listening to this, get them right now if you don't have a ticket yet because they are getting gobbled up, in Ali's words, faster than a lithium undeveloped project by Christina in Western Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's, um, all right, let's, let's, let's play our interview from Mark. Kudafani. Kudafani. Thank Much. you very much, Mark. Let's rip it. G'day, Money Miners. We're uh, absolutely delighted to be sitting down next to Mark Kudafani, um, who, despite having an absolutely phenomenal career at, you know, tier one mining companies, uh, is from the very humble Wollongong himself. And as I just learned in the pre-conversation, um, mate, you spent a stint living in my old stomping ground in Kalgoorlie. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on our, our podcast. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm, there are lots of different angles to start. We should give the, the money miners a bit of a background on Mark. So, you know, some of the companies, Anglo-American, De Beers, anglo Gold Ashanti, Sons of Gualia is another one we saw on your quite long CV that we, I think we- We've got an affinity to that one. Yeah. <laughs> we have to touch on, um, can you firstly clarify to us what the years were? We were trying to dig in that you were at Sons of Gualia? So I was in Sons of Gualia from 2000 to the end of 2002. Perfect. And we've noticed a sort of, um, there's been a theme that we spoke about a few weeks ago that was hedging. And you mentioned it again we, in an interview you did regarding your time at Anglo as well. But yeah. keen to- Yeah, you said, you said Anglo Gold Ashanti at one point had the world's worst hedge book. Yeah. Um, and it's re really interesting that kind of unpacking the history of, of how gold miners, you know, thought about their hedge book and the trends in relation to it. And one of those trends that we weren't quite aware of until, you know, deep dive with Sean Russo of Noah's Rule was, um, was that kind of period in the early 2010s when all of the, the gold miners who had out of the money hedge books raised equity capital to pay it all back. <laughs> Keen to um, hear just a high level, how the trends have changed in hedging that you've seen over, over your period in the mining industry over the last four decades or so? So I started in the gold industry. I originally started in the coal industry. Yeah. Uh, I was there for 12 years and I started in the gold mines literally in Kalgoorlie. Yeah. Uh, started the super pit yeah. back in uh, first... 88 is when I started, but we actually started the super pit as a consolidated entity back in uh, 1989. Now, at KCGM, Kalgoorlie mm. Consolidated Gold Mines, we didn't have hedging. We sold our gold to the two owners, being Homestake and Normandy. So it wasn't an issue for us. But a few years later, I actually was the Chief Operating Officer for Normandy. Mm. And uh, Normandy, had, Normandy had a very successful forward 
hedging program, but they sold their hedge book when it was well in the money. Mm. So they did extremely well. Um, I joined Sons of Gualia in 2000 uh, as the managing director. And in our first three months, uh, we found that we had quite a lot of gold hedging and foreign exchange hedging. Now, it was the time when yeah. the Aussie dollar had fallen from about 70 cents to about 49 cents. So the whole economic situation changed. So I came in after all the hedges had been put in place. Mm. So my job with the team was to um, try and manage and reduce the hedge book while we were there. And I was there for uh, about two and a half years and we made a lot of progress, but obviously a few years later they, they ended up uh, succumbing to the hedge book. And so there's a lot of lessons there around um, hedging, mm. understanding what uh, you're hedging your inputs and the gold price. Totally. But at some point, um, if uh, prices move the wrong way, then there's always risk around those sorts of propositions. Now, you mentioned Anglo Gold, Asha uh, Anglo -Gold Ashanti. Yeah, yeah. I ended up being appointed the chief executive of Anglo Gold Ashanti, and they knew of my son's Aguilar experience dealing with hedge books. Uh, and they said, look, we've got a big hedge book. And the fact that you've had experience in dealing with a hedge book uh, is something we're looking for, as well as your operating experience and everything else. And in my first 18 months, we dismantled the Anglo Gold Ashanti hedge book. And when you talked about using equity, um, mm. we mm. used equity at Anglo Gold. They all but, did. But here's mm. the key number. Uh, in the 18 months, or in our first 18 months, the, the gold hedge book, or the gold was hedged at an average price of $350 an ounce. So that is, you had to deliver gold yep. into contracts. Yep. $350 an ounce. The gold price was 600 yeah. and going north. It reminds me of Regis. <laughs> so I said to the board, we need to, um, in my view, get rid of the hedge book because if the price goes above 1,000, then the exposure of the company is quite significant. The board agreed. And in that 18 months, we dismantled the hedge book. There were 12 million ounces in the hedge book. And by the time we finished, We'd spent, um, I think it was around um, seven to eight billion. The gold price peaked at $1,900 an ounce. And if we still had a hedge book when that occurred, we would have been almost $20 billion in the red. There would be totally. no company. Totally. So what we did in 2008, 2009 saved the company. Yeah, and again, that experience from seeing hedge books earlier in my career was very helpful in, in making that that decision. And it was a big call of the time, but it, it was the right call. It's, it's interesting, the, um, the, what, what appeared to be a bit of a, a tendency of um, yeah, miners to kind of roll the hedge book, um, deliver at higher prices in the short term, but ultimately pay the price in the long term because you end up with uh, more, more sort of hedging further out at a lower real, real dollar price. And then in a rising price environment, that can kind of Bite, bite in the butt. It's a it's a common trend in um in, mining, in gold mining companies. The, the I don't know if it's a common trend. Yeah. I think there are certain companies that have said, look, um, hedging is a good strategy. And if, even if you go back to Sons of Gualia, yeah, in the prior fifteen or sixteen years, they had done extremely well mm. out of hedging. Yeah. And the book that when I came to the company was was already in place. Um, they had done extremely well, but the problem was the market started to change. Foreign exchange, gold price started to go up so that the contracts they had in place were out of the money yeah. and, and getting worse. And the key production. then was, what do you do? But remember the previous 20 years, almost 20 years, they had done extremely well. The lessons for me, and I think the lessons more broadly in our industry, mm. firstly, hedging is a legitimate strategy to totally. protect revenues totally. in certain circumstances. 100%. And how you finance a project. Exactly. Now, you also need to understand that you're taking a risk on yeah. because there's the other side of that. If prices don't go the right way, then you end up out of the money. And you have a commitment to a deliver key, production. A key learning yeah. is you're going to hedge the price. You probably need to hedge your inputs as well mm. so that you're protecting your margin. margin. Yeah. And that's where most companies make the mistake. And in large companies that I've run you know, mm. in the last 25, 30 years, 
we look at the position of the asset and try and make sure that we're in the bottom half of the cost curve and, and get the basics right. Therefore, the need for hedging is yep. something that, that there isn't really a debate. Yep. Yep. Um, and with the broader portfolios, there's a natural hedge in the number of commodities or in the jurisdictions you're operating. So yep. again, um, I don't think you should say hedging is all negative, no. but there are two sides to the equation and you better know exactly what you're hedging and what your positions are, and how do you unwind them in a way that doesn't threaten the company's a key issue? Yeah. Mark, I want to move tax slightly. Um, you've got a much more sort of global view than a lot of the companies we speak about on a day-to-day -day basis, the sort of smaller to mid-cap companies. And I'm keen to hear this sort of debate of buy over build at the moment that you see with a lot of the, the majors thinking it's so expensive to get a large-scale operation into production recently. Do you sort of see a changing of the trend any time in the, the next five years or so where a lot of the companies, you know, the, the BHBs of the world will start to pile the capital in to actually get some projects online as opposed to mm. going and buying the, they did just the copper miners. seven billion and, dollar uh, stage two of, of, of Janssen, I think it was yesterday, but that's, yeah. A commodity where it might be hard <laughs> to so, find that so scale. I'll give you two, yeah. let me give you two perspectives yeah. because uh, like, most things in our industry, it's never a black and white choice. Uh, when I started with Anglo-American um, in uh, 2013, the first thing I had to clean up in the company was the Minas Rio project, which was bought for 5.5 billion. And then they committed another three and a half billion to build the new project. So they bought the resource mm -hmm. and the project cost blew out to eight and a half billion. So there was a $14 billion commitment in building that new asset. And um, the building of the asset was only about 30% of the way through when I started. Mm. So we had to re-estimate the whole project. We re-estimated and we actually delivered from when we started on the re-estimation work and the recalibration, we actually delivered on the budget numbers and we delivered on the timing. The trouble was there'd been so much money lost beforehand that the overall project looked pretty bad by the end. The good news is that project's delivered very good cash flow since and has been a real contributor against the base that we started with. It's delivered, I think it's something like a 20 to 25% return. Trouble is mm. all the money that was spent, all, all that, the co sunk cost the real, actually yeah. really made, made it look a, a pretty, yeah. you know, seven or eight percent return, which is quite disappointing. Now, roll the clock on, Anglo then built Kiaveco, which is the largest, or in the last 20 years, probably the most successful major project mm. in the global mining industry, four and a half thousand metres high in Peru, so a jurisdiction that people can see some risk in. We delivered on time, on budget, through COVID. Mm. And the key to that was making sure we understood the resource, making sure that the planning work or the understanding of the resource and the planning and development work was in sufficient detail to be confident of what we could do. But the most important issue, we built a relationship with the local community and it became their project and they were the key and one of the keys to helping us deliver on time and on schedule. So it can be done, but it takes a lot of work and you need both the social skills, the technical skills, and the construction skills to get all those pieces right. So you have done relatively similar projects in what you just mentioned, and then text QB2, similar parts of the world, and the outcomes were pretty different, you know, in terms of on time, on budget. What, what are the key differences that, you know, the future majors need to, to get right to ensure that you're getting it on time, on budget, and the project then delivers the returns you're so expecting. I, I, look, I'm, I'm always careful about commenting on others. Again, you've quoted the numbers and you know the, 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 time, the time delays and the cost, so I won't go further on that. Other than to say at Anglo, we built a team under Tony O'Neill that had already successfully delivered projects, Tom McCulley, uh, and that team, and we did our homework and we got the detail right. But again, the work we did in the community was very different to the way most projects are done. We did a round table. So the Kiveco project had been around for something like 15 to 18 years and couldn't get developed. Yeah. 
When we came in and when I started, we did a review of the portfolio of projects. We let a few projects go because I thought that they'd be difficult and I wasn't convinced on the return. But Key of Echo was the one that I thought was the, the one we could deliver. So we put a team in, did a full review of the resource, what had been done. We made quite a few significant changes. We redefined the scope, made sure that we had a very robust resource and uh, project execution plan for the construction. And we worked very closely with the, the community. And the governor of the province in 2012 convened a round table with the community to get their input into what they wanted in the project. Because we said to the community, we want to understand what you want as a community in the next five, 10, 20 years. We want to understand how we can be a contributor to what you're trying to achieve as a community so that we can become a partner in the development of this new project. They bought into it. They identified in the round table 26 projects that were critical for them as a community. Mm. We committed to build and work with them on those projects through the, through the development phase. And people say, well, why? Didn't that cost you a lot? Well, those projects cost mm. about $650 million, which is about 12% mm, of the capital budget. But we already had $700 million in there for environmental social projects that we'd already costed. But they were the things that we thought they should have in the community, or we thought that's what the community would want. But when we actually did the round table, which was very deliberate, we actually found out what they wanted. And what they wanted was very different to what we thought they wanted. Yeah. And so we built the project on the basis of what the community wanted, and it made such a difference. So in the end, through COVID and then in commissioning, they were as much a part of the project as all of our employees and everybody within Anglo uh, was, and it was a great success and, and something we're very proud of. I'd be curious to um, to go down that that partner thread at some point, but I um, I often think the way that we talk about our you know mines interaction in communities lacks a little bit of nuance and sophistication, and and there's and a lot of mining companies, not the big ones, they often are quite responsible, but some of the smaller ones aren't so responsible, and there's a you know an importance to to treat communities as a partner sometimes that involves equity to have maximum alignment i think but that's often i think overlooked you go people go default to the royalty sort of um method and and, and the likes but you mentioned working in the community right south africa is a jurisdiction that you've had plenty of experience with um operations and when you talk to mining investors today and you ask which jurisdictions are a no for you almost first on the list is South Africa. A lot of people just put a line through it. What's your observation of that mentality? Um, and kind of, and do you, do you agree with that as a sentiment? So am I allowed to comment on your editorial statement? Oh, absolutely. I okay, love it. so that, that lack of sophistication that you, yeah. you alluded to, that's a fair criticism of the industry more broadly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure it only pertains to the junior end of the, the, the industry. It's probably right across the board. I think the important thing for all of us to, to and this, this is about lessons learned, is consulting with the community and making sure we understand what they want. That's the really important piece, which is very different. So when we do our faith-based um, uh, engagements, community engagements, we're looking at all of our stakeholders to try and make sure we understand what people are looking for. Second point, quite often it's not equity that they want. No. They want participation in some way, shape or form. So in many cases, it'll be in the form of community projects. Secondly, it could be equity. Third, it might be a royalty or something different because quite often equity, when they work out how cyclic the industry is and how difficult, how much risk there is in the project, many Communities say, well, we actually, we probably don't want equity. What we want is a reliable revenue stream. So many go for a royalty instead. But the key is ask them and help them understand what the options are. And I think that makes all the difference. And that's the key. Yeah. But the point on um, equity, is there a difference in asking the community early and then, like, let's say a generation later, the decision makers at the time, um, feel like there's a disproportionate amount of the economics leaving the country and then there can be a, a change in sentiment. If, you, if there is equity 
as well, part that, of that? Does that change the dynamics? Well, th- then I go back to your word that you yeah. used. I'm going to use your word, yeah. sophistication. Yeah. We don't do a good job explaining that when you look at the pie, and let's take the revenue base of the mine, mm. in most cases, local employment, uh, communities, when you take employment, use of local suppliers, and all the other things that we pay to produce an ounce of gold or a pound of copper, 85 to 90% of the revenue stay in country. And that includes capital, because don't forget, it's not simply about operating costs, it's also the capital we spend is spent locally in the communities or buying parts of equipment, oil, gas, all of those things stay in country. So when you're talking about money going elsewhere, it's the it's it's somewhere between five and fifteen percent the revenue base for the people that put the capital up to develop so that everybody could benefit from the development of that resource. Most people don't understand that 90% of the value stays in country. Now, that's a different conversation because in the end, we don't do a very good job explaining where the value and where the money goes. That's a problem, not their fault, it's our fault for not explaining well where the, where the, where the value is and who gets what. Totally. Mark, there's a there's a deal that we spoke about a couple months ago that you're quite close to in your role as chairman of Vale Base Metals, and that was uh, the Saudi investment fund as well as a, a US counterpart buying a stake in the in the business from Vale. Vale what Base I'm, Metals, yeah. Yeah. What I'm fascinated to hear from your perspective is how big a player is Saudi Arabia going to be in metals and mining going forward? Well, I think, well, they're already a significant player, but they're going to be a much more significant player. And and if you look at um, their position in oil and gas, Aramco, the biggest oil and gas company in the world, um, if you look at their involvement in a whole range of sectors, including golf, for example, they've become quite um, entrepreneurial, outward looking, looking to participate in the global economy um, a lot more and more effectively. And so they're saying, look, we've got great mineral resources. We should also look at developing our minerals industry. And to be a player on the global stage, we probably want to trade some commodities. We want to do other things. So I think they're going to be significant. And certainly from everything they've said uh, publicly, uh, they're talking about a lot of very significant growth and being a, a, a major player in the industry. Now, again, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think investing in resources, doing it the right way um, is, is, uh, is good for the industry and it provides more investment because let's, let's face it, the world is short critical minerals. Without mining industry, and a lot of people don't understand this, the agriculture sector takes up 40% of the world's surface. Without mining, they would need 50 to 60% of the world's surface because fertilizers and other products actually help improve farm productivities. So without that, we'd have to cut down a lot more forests. Second thing people don't understand, urbanization. So 8 billion people on the planet, we take up about 15% of the Earth's surface through cities and infrastructure development. Without mining, we'd need 20 to 30% of the Earth's surface because we'd have to spread out because we can't build up. And so without mining, we would have to, we would literally lose 50% of our biodiversity. And so it would be cataclysmic. And people don't understand that net-net, mining is the most important industry in terms of the environment on the face of the planet. Net ground or net land uh, freed for biodiversity is 25% of human footprint is shrunk. We only take up 0.3% of the Earth's surface for our activities. If you take an average mine life of somewhere between 20 and 30 years, and so let's take that over 100 years, it's still less than, if we look at rehabilitation, it's still less than about 0.8% of the Earth's surface. So net environmental footprint on mining is massively positive. We don't tell that story, and that's one of the issues that I think we've got to do much better on. And that's why this is such a great forum. Getting that message out to the the world at large is really important. Kids don't know how the world works. Us explaining how we play our part in making the world a better place is very important. I think we uh, try and do our part as well on on 
putting a bit of nuance into this discussion there. Pat ourselves um, on the back there. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm interested to ask you on the, on the sort of geopolitical theme, another question. So we saw starting in 2013, China with the One Belt, One Road initiative, expanding massively through Africa and other parts of the world. And we've seen more recently, a lot of that investment has sort of slowed from China and the US and Western aligned countries have gotten a bit more vocal, not necessarily actions yet, but they've gotten more vocal in you know, wanting to invest in Africa, for example. Critical minerals. Exactly. Yep. How do you see that sort of theme playing out? Do you see a bit more of a tug of war, say, on, on the theme of Africa with the Western countries going in, investing in critical minerals? Yeah, there's so, also the trend of the, you know, some of the Canadian gold miners, lit, like, you know, moving outside of Africa, you're seeing them diversify into... Pakistan, for example, is, with yes, uh, Barrick and Rekha Dick. Look, um, first point, I think we all need to acknowledge that the Chinese have been quite strategic in investing in Africa, um, investing in other countries in terms of access to global resources. Now, when you think about it, 1.3 billion people modernising, GDP per person, tripling, uh, helping support growth across the globe, it's been a good thing, I think, for the standard of living across the globe, and, and they have created more competition for those resources. Western countries have been slow to come to the game, not understanding how important critical minerals are. In fact, all minerals are. In fact, most people don't understand in terms of the energy transition, it's not copper, it's not nickel in terms of the most important metal for the energy transitions, it's actually steel. And Australia's role with iron ore and metco, absolutely critical in terms of the energy transition. Copper is still very important. So. One, you've got to acknowledge their strategic approach. Two, one might argue that their relationships through Africa and other places aren't as good as they could be. And by the way, many people in the mining industry, we could be accused of the same sorts of issues in terms of not doing as well as we could for communities. And I think the KVECO approach is a good example of how it should be. But the US, Australia, other countries are moving in and trying to become more competitive and competing for some of those resources in Africa. So I think it changes the dynamic. But again, I think we've got to be careful in singling out China. The fact that they were strategic and were accessing resources reflected their understanding of what they needed to fuel their own growth. We've got to be, I think, open, constructive and, and provide a better model if we want to do better than the Chinese in accessing resources across the world. The good news is if we go in with a very positive approach, it's good for the local communities that are working with us to develop those resources. So we need to make it a positive, not a negative conversation. At the moment, I, I see it being more negative than it should be. It should be about how we can all do better, which means we uplift local communities. Um, I'm interested in asking you a question on valuation, especially with the, in particular on the, the major mining companies. So a debate I've had recently with uh, natural resource investors is that the the majors, the Rio Tintos, the BHBs of the world, the multiples that they trade on, perhaps you know five or six times earnings, is you know unfair in comparison to tech businesses. Given the long life of their assets, given the competitive landscape of other industries not perhaps being appreciated, have you got a view on how you see multiples of major mining companies given? the sort of propensity to increase reserve life and, you know, in recent times, you know, disciplined capital management and capital allocation. Do you have any thoughts around the, the multiples As there? As a CEO, yeah, that's my, it's, <laughs> that's, you know, it's Always my life. Always yeah. <laughs> and when I, started, when I started at Anglo, we were trading at a 30 to 40% discount uh, to Rio and BHP against the financial multiples. Is that, last day is that we a discount to NAV? Like, people, is that price to NAV ratio? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so on, on financial metrics, yeah. and, and when I left, we were we were pricing at a ten percent premium yeah. to our competitors. So we made a big shift, and people say, "Well, what did you do to shift?" I said, "Well, first, we improved our our business, improved our performance, more consistent, delivered against the numbers we said we'd deliver it against. We reduced our operating cost by forty five percent in real terms, thirty percent nominally. So we did a lot better. Our returns were better." Um, and we did a lot better in terms of our relationships with countries. So, for example, in South Africa, when Anglo re-domiciled, the South Africans said, you can't use any cash from South Africa 
uh, to invest in other locations. That constraint was removed about seven years into my tenure on the basis that the work we'd done in South Africa was constructive, it was positive, it actually delivered on the commitments we'd made to the government and they said we're going to remove those constraints. Now that's part of the reason why yeah. our performance picked up. The other thing is we invested in innovation, long-term new technologies that would change the performance of the company, would continue improving the business and people could see that commitment and were prepared to pay a better amount, were pay more for the shares on the basis of the view that we'd outperform over time because we were investing in the future. In our industry, we're notoriously low, or we, we invest a notoriously small amount in terms of future technology, and Anglo got re rewarded for its investment. That's the difference, and I think as an industry, we've got to think more. We've been mining the same way for 100 years, the gears got better, but we haven't fundamentally, cha haven't fundamentally changed the flow sheets. That's what's changing now, and I think with that we'll get better premiums. Mm. Depends on your resource base. And, and and do you think framing that question as an industry-wide sort of multiple? Do you think things like that lift the tide, not just of Anglo specifically, but if you've got the technology or not? <laughs> well, I think we've got to stop blaming the markets. Yeah. For our short-term thinking. Yeah. You know, the reality is the markets were telling us that we can't see you performing consistently over the long term because we can't see the investment that gives us comfort that that's what you'll do. Mm -hmm. So what we've got to do is change our behaviours and take a balance today, tomorrow and the longer term and that's what we were very conscious of doing with our sustainability strategy, with our long-term investment in innovation. And that's the sort of conversation that we're bringing to Valet in terms of the new businesses that we're doing and what we're doing in terms of the assets. And that will take time to improve our business but we've got real focus on the long term. And we would hope that that approach is reflected through in the share price for Vale over time, because it work, certainly works for Anglo-American. Like I've got one, one more one to sort of maybe round us out. And that's um, in relation to, you, you made a comment earlier about the importance of having an asset that's in the, um, the lowest uh, cost, um, the lowest half of the cost curve. And I'd love to get you to kind of unpack why those assets are the ones to hold to have really like you know sustainable life as a miner and secondly um like how do you contextualize that desire amid you know uh Vale's base metal business so first point on on being uh, we always talked about being in the bottom half of the cost curve now the reason i i, I talk about the bottom half everybody wants to be the lowest cost producer oh yeah and if you ask 75% yeah. of the industry, they're, in the they're all in the first yeah, quarter. 100%, 100%. So that, the maths don't goody. work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I've always said, look, yeah. on a portfolio basis, we want to be in the bottom half of the cost curve on an aggregate basis, and it's a very simple logic. The volatility of prices being in the bottom half of the cost curve, the chances are you'll be cash flow positive through the cycle. Mm -hmm. That's key. If you're cash flow positive through the cycle, you're more likely to make rational long-term decisions that create value for shareholders through the cycle. Mm -hmm. That's important. If a company's losing cash, then quite often the decisions we make to preserve cash damage long-term value, medium to longer-term value. Now, it's, it's not that black and white, it's not that totally. simple, but that's the logic. Now, yeah. so that's why I said the bottom half of the cost of it. Now, if you pursue the first quartile, mm -hmm. That means you might change your cutoff grade, you might shorten your life to achieve that. So that mm. bottom half of the cost curve gives you a fair bit of room to get the maximum out of the resource over time mm. and manage cash flow. Now, in our industry, if you can deliver 10% free cash flow after replacing your resources and reserves and making sure all your mine development's in place, you will be rated in the top 25% of companies on the stock market. If you can deliver 10%, because those companies generally are the uh, those that are valued at the top quartile. If you can deliver 15% through the cycle, 15% free cash flow on capital employed through the cycle, yep. you're at the top of the game. It's yep. that tight. It's like great tennis players. There's only about 10% difference in terms of the points won, totally. but boy, that 10% is worth a lot of money. 
Totally. Absolutely. Compound interest, right? It all, uh, it is, it, it, it rightfully has the premium. <laughs> Um, and, Mark, and to relate to finally well, wrap out contextualizing well, the I'll make one other point business. one other point and I'll yeah. use numbers yeah. Anglo Anglo American 22% average return to shareholders year on year for nine years and that cash flow the way we used to think about that 10% or 30 we, ours was about 13% free cash flow margin 40% to dividends three uh, 30% to internal business improvement, our innovation, so we had a forward look. And the other 30% was on uh, operating costs, improving our business so uh, uh, and growth. So you had 40% dividend, 30% internal improvement, keeping ourselves competitive, and 30% on growth. So when you looked at a total return to shareholders, you would get your 40% dividend, so 4%, if it's a 10% free cash flow, you'd get 3% on growth, so there's 7%. And we felt that if we could hold our cost flat in nominal terms, the natural inflation and growth in the price of the commodities, depending on competitive position, would give you another kicker, which would allow you to get somewhere in the range of 10 to 15% return on capital employed. We delivered 22% over the nine years because the premium that we also got on the financial returns was above and beyond the 15%. And that's how you create value in this industry over the long term. Mark, massively appreciate you making the time to come on Money of Mine. It's been great to chat. Thank appreciate you very much, guys. Right. Good luck right. and well done. Thank Cheers, you. mate. There we go, mate. I found that a, a pretty fascinating chat. You know, you, you feel you get CEOs of big companies, you know, chairpersons of these big organizations and you can you can sometimes feel like you know what they're going to say and so on and <laughs> like you said at the beginning of the show they're often well versed in media you don't run a multi-billion dollar company no. and not be able to palm off yeah. a couple of 20 something year olds and their Very sort true. of sticky questions you know so he's no he knows what he's all about but my goal to- is my goal is to to really you know get the get the experience and to Peel back a little bit of the the, uh, the media polish, JD, on our interviews. That's we, it. We, may, maybe next time with Mark, we'll get get a bit further than the uh, <laughs> the, than the the very polished um, uh, responses. But there was still heaps of insight in those responses. Yeah, absolutely. Regardless, there was still a lot of gold, and it's always fascinating to hear and learn from someone with you know four odd decades of experience in the industry. So I tell you what, mate. I can't wait to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Sydney has chewed you up and spat you out, mate. Oh, I've had I've had a lot of fun and met some really um, yeah awesome people, a bunch of awesome like listeners of this podcast, and it's yeah it's invigorating to hear the um, amount of support for our work that is out here in Sydney. I'm just knackered. Mate, I'm just be, exhausted. I want to go home. It'll be I Sunday. Wanna... You'll be at puppy training in no time, mate. I just, <laughs> yeah. well, hang out with my puppy. <laughs> Fair enough, I'll mate. Go we got away. one more day to, to hang out in, in the big smoke in Sydney. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've got a couple other interviews to share with the, um, the money miners coming up. But let's just round out and thank the, uh, the dear sponsors of our show. We've got MMTS, a new one this week, KCA site. KCA site services, which we touched on at the beginning of the show. Mate, we've also got some of the oldies, Terra Capital, Anytime Exploration Services, K-Drill, SMEC, JP Search, and Future Proof Consulting. Much appreciated support, guys. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult appropriate the advice is to your objectives financial situation and needs